You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. Well, it's good to be here with you all today. Again, it's, uh, I think I preached here one time before, and I think that's all it is. But uh, I've been, uh, it's been a pleasure to meet with Jeff often uh, and to uh, stay connected with him and what's going on here. And I feel like it uh, helps me to be able to pray for you folks and uh, as you continue to, uh, to see what God's mission is here for you at this church. Uh, just some of you have asked where my wife is today. My wife got caught in grandmother emergency duty. Some of you know what that's about. But she brings her greetings here, uh, my wife April. So, um, and she'll probably watch the service online. I don't know. Maybe she is now. So I don't want to say anything bad about her right now. <laughs> Actually, there's nothing bad to say. It's about me. So today, um, I wasn't sure what we were going to I talked to Jeff a little about what we, were, what we wanted to talk about this morning. But the word I want to talk about this morning is commitment. Um, what things are we committed to? And maybe what does commitment even look like in today's world? And maybe you think it's a simple word. Um, but I think uh, commitment is really hard for many of us, or maybe at least to follow through with those commitments. Uh, for instance, let me give you for instance, for every year, about the end of December, I started thinking about what my New Year's resolutions will be. Well, they're really commitments. And it's crazy because about every year I make a New Year's resolution and about 20 days later, it's out the window already. Any of you know what that's like? So what does that say about our commitment? You know, it might, might be, I, might, I need to lose weight. How about 10 pounds? And, you know, for a couple of weeks, the dieting's good and kind of and pretty soon it's gone, uh, right? So year after year, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Commitment is often defined in today's world as something that we invest in, but until things get too hard to keep invested in them. In other words, so there's not, the word commitment at heart means your commitment to the end, but we, we, we have blown that over and over again. And unfortunately, our ability to commit to things of faith has gone the same way. Uh, you know, we say we want to pray and have devotions every day. Well, something got in the way, and pretty soon we're, we're lapsed on that, right? Or we want to read through our Bible in a year, and we get, we get going, and we, and we have failures, and then we feel bad, and, and it, it kind of drags us down. And, and what about church? We say, well, what does, what does this church have for me today? And, you know, some of you have been going to this church for many, many years. You've been through some tough things and some ups and some downs, and commitment to that church really builds a, a relationship with one another, it builds a community of faith that, that has each other's backs. And I think that's getting to what commitment's really about. Commitment's really about relationships. It's not about committing to things or discipline. It's, it's how do we deal with our relationships? And, and I think we're so distracted and busy today by the different things we can be part of, and we somehow think that we can, um, we, we, we can make our own priorities for our own life. So uh, if I was to ask you, for instance, uh, and I've done this to people, how do, how do you prioritize these things? God and family and work and relationships and some of the pleasure we take, we all would answer, I really believe this, we would all answer, yes, it's God and family and some of my relationships, and then work and pleasure. But how do we practice that, really? I mean, what, what, are we honest with that? Uh, we say the correct things, but what's the reality? And, and uh, sometimes I think we have to be more honest about this. So what we end up doing is we try to balance life um, by continuing to do things, more things. And, and, and what happens is uh, we... We get, out, we get out of schedule. Um, so I want to just show you this. See if this. I'm trying to remember how this works. Here we go. Try this. Does that work? 
Yeah. It feels like life sometimes is on a hamster wheel. Ever feel that way? The, the, you're on that wheel, and you're reaching for more. You want more. You want more. And it goes faster. And you keep spinning, and you keep going. I think I, think I can stay on there. I think I can stay on there. And you're so afraid to tell anybody that I'm worn out, that I can't keep up this pace anymore. And, and we keep adding things on to it. And don't get me wrong. I believe that when it comes to commitment, responsibility is important. And, and in this area in Lancaster County, effort is important, right? We, we work hard. We really do. Um, but the more time we spend on the wheel, the more it keeps going faster. Uh, so living like this just gets us out of breath. Life goes on each day, and we feel like we definitely can't say anything to anyone, including those closest to us, which is hard, because we, might, we feel like they might think there's something wrong with us. Well, Joshua has gotten to a point in his life. If you, let me just recall Joshua's life. He was one of the two spies. Remember when, they, when the Israelites were scouting out the land? He said, yep, the land's good. Ended up spending 40 years wandering in the wilderness. He finally is there and is put in charge when he's about in his mid-60s. So he's even a little older than me. Some of you may, so you're just, some of you know what Joshua's going through. And the next several years for the Israelites was a fantastic time. They trusted God fully. God led them through some huge battles. And, and, and they had, they had, conquered the world. They're living in this land of plenty. I mean, Joshua's been sitting around eating these grapes that they say were so great. Honey, milk was flowing, and the people were enjoying life. And now it's about 30 years later, when we get to Joshua 24 today, he's 100 years old. And all of a sudden, Joshua looks back and says, wow, do we even remember what it was like, our commitment to God was like? We're, we're, we're living a pleasurable life, and we're getting more and more things, and we're getting wealthy, and we're feeling good about ourselves. But what about God? That commitment is coming. So in chapter 23, I'm not going to look at it right now, but I'm just going to give you a rephrase. After a long time um, had passed, uh, and like 30 years or so, the Lord had given them uh, rest from all their enemies. He reflects on his life and his relationship with God. And he looks around, and he sees the land around them. The people have a lack of commitment to God. They're, in other words, they, they say, yeah, God. we would prioritize God first. But in practice, no, God wasn't first. You know, other things were in the way. And, and, and what's great, Joshua also said, hey, that same thing happened to me, too. So at 100 years old, he knows he's got to give advice, kind of last words to his people. His last words and advice was basically this. People remember to keep the main thing the main thing. And recommit your life to God. Let's get back to the basic, he says. And basically he's saying it's time to get off this hamster wheel. Uh, so if we look at, at the, if we start looking at verse uh, chapter 24 of Joshua, I don't know if you have your Bibles open or not. I'm going to read most of what I want to read today. But the beginning part of the chapter, verses 2 to 13, are kind of background um, that we need. So in verse 2, what he does, he calls all the people together uh, with a word from the Lord. Okay, so he's actually speaking for God here. Uh, and, and what he's doing is really helping them to reflect on their past with God. Uh, the Israelites passed, and it reminds them that God, it was God who led them, not themselves, and, and that this memory leads should lead them to a deeper commitment or a time of recommitment even. So, you know, if we just summarize verses 2 to 13, he says, uh, long ago your ancestors used to worship other gods. And then he says, but I, God, I took Abraham and I led him, I gave him the promise, I led Isaac I, I was with Jacob and Esau. I was with Moses. You can remember all this stuff because the Israelites knew their history. And, and with Aaron. And, and, I, and, and God was with me, Joshua. And, and God says, I led them. I guided them. Do you remember, he says. Do you remember all the battles? Do you remember crossing the Jordan? And it's clear through all of that that God is who they needed to commit to. But we have gotten caught up ourselves in our own lives, just like they did. And we have 
somehow taking God's place. We know what's best, we think, and we jump on the, on the hamster wheel, and we've forgotten that there's a, something else more important that's a relationship with God. And then we come to verse 13, which caps the whole remembering part of, and then we're getting ready into what I want to talk about today. He says this, So I gave you the land on which you did not toil, and cities that you did not build, and you live in them, you eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now, I don't know how some of you would feel about that. A lot of what we have, we've earned. At least I feel that, right? You know, for you farmers, you've, 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 you've tilled the land. You know, you, you know where to plant the right crops. You've harvested the crops. What would it be like for you to go to a place and God says, you, you can live here. Everybody did all the work for you, you know. And God's saying, that's what I did for you. And now you're living and you're relaxing and you're enjoying things you didn't even earn. I gave them to you. And it's just a reminder that God is and is always in control of our commitments and of our attention, of our affection. um, And our affection should be for him and him alone. So then we get to the verses I really want to look at. Joshua 24, I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. That's about commitment right there. Throw away the gods with a little g. Your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and and in Egypt and, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It seems crazy that Joshua would have to recommit himself. Joshua, the commander, the one who trusted God, the one who led, yet he himself has to rededicate, recommit. And I think God wants us to make that choice for ourselves, too. And there's three things, really, that he says right here that are important for us to know. Fear the Lord. In other words, be in awe of who God is and and what God has done in our lives. And then serve him in all faithfulness. I don't know what serving means for you. It means different things for all of us. But it means to to go out shining the light for God in all we do and and showing God's love to others and then throw away the other gods. Man, that's the hardest one for me. This time of year, you know what? I love football. It it may be a god. In fact, most people tell me it is, and I don't want to hear it, you know? We all have these little gods that distract us and keep us from serving fully and, and and. And Joshua says, wow, in my life, over the last 30 years living in comfort here, I have some gods. i got to throw them away. i got to rededicate myself. And it is, it is a commitment to seeing God's greatness every day in our lives, choosing to make God first or a priority in our lives. And it's, it's about God's agenda instead of, instead of our agenda. And that's one of the ways that you can get off of the wheel. I'll tell you, uh, something that changed in my life uh, maybe in the last 15 years, 20 years, I mean, in the morning, I I would say, before I roll out of bed, I'm going to pray. The alarm gets off, and I'd start praying. And all of a sudden, I'd realize, man, i got a lot of stuff on my mind today. So, Lord, help me with this. Please help me. Help my my wife with this. Help my kids. They need help today. You know, help my family. Help these, blah, blah. And, And before you know it, I get out of bed, and I'm really worked up. Man, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's done now. You know what I pray in the morning? Maybe I told you this already because I tell a lot of people this. It's really helped me. God, show me the people you want me to talk to today. And I roll out of bed. And you know, I got to tell you, more than 50% of the time, more than half the time, God has somebody to talk to. I I think, you know, I was thinking, I'm going to go share my faith with everybody. I'm going to be good. People inspire me. More than, more than half the time, people, God sends people to encourage me. It's crazy to lift me up. But, but it starts with that idea, look, God, I don't want to get on this hamster wheel today. I want to be off that wheel. So it's your agenda. 
show me who you want me to talk to. It's led me to pick up hitchhikers. It, it, I could tell you stories. Uh, you know, going into a restaurant, sitting down next to somebody that I think, boy, this guy really needs me to minister to him today. And I walk away and cry my eyes out when I leave. I mean, this is what we're talking about here, I think. Um, but he says, serve. Uh, um, it's a commitment to seeing God's greatness every day. And, and it's, it's realizing what other gods we are serving. And there's a lot of them. Our work can be a god. Money, success, even church, family, it, it goes on and on. But he says, whatever, get rid of those things, serve him with all faithfulness. Now, verse 15 really cracks me up. It says, um, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, does it? Of course it does. It seems undesirable to me. It goes against everything I am as a, as a strong man. Because it means I have to yield to God's control. I mean, if I'm driving in the car somewhere, I want to be behind the wheel. How many of you are like that? I mean, if I've, I, I just drove back from New York. We had a big bishop retreat up at Camp Deer Park in New York. I was sitting all the way in the back. And even from the back, my foot almost hit the brake up front a couple times. You know what I mean? I want to be in control. If I'm going to crash into a deer or a tree or something, I want to be the one that hits it. You know what I mean? But that's the way it is. Of course, it seems undesirable to us, you know? Be, and, and think about Jesus' call to us. Take up your cross and follow. Boy, that seems undesirable, doesn't it? Okay, let me pick up some baggage, you know, and, and follow. It's not really what he means. You know what I mean. But, but these are yield control. It just seems undesirable. And because of that, many people never give God the chance. And you know why? It's because we as Christians say, well, I guess I got to serve today. Yep. Got to be obedient today. We feel, we, we put on this undesirable idea and people, how is, how do people want to be part of what we, who we are if we act that way? I'm speaking for myself, of course. Um, but here's the thing. I ask this question of myself. Doesn't also the life that I have chosen when I'm on that hamster wheel, isn't that undesirable as well? Isn't that causing me problems? Stress? So maybe we need to do something different and actually jump off the wheel. And, and many lives and families suffer from this lack of direction and vision. Joshua says, as for me and my household, we're choosing to serve the Lord. And I believe the truth is, for our families and our children's and our relationship that we have around us, our spouses are longing for us to make that choice for ourselves and for our families as well. Well, then we get to Joshua 24, verses 16 to 18. Let me read that for you. Then the people answered, far be it for us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations uh, through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Okay, so they heard all that Joshua said, the, you know, the, the reminders. They, they grabbed a hold of them. Um, and, and what I say is people are often attracted to those who are willing to be decisive. Joshua was a witness to them, and they were attracted to him. Uh, I, I, I'm always amazed at how when we're able to share stories with one another of how God has worked in our lives. You know, it could be through illnesses, it could be a relationship, it could be whatever it would be. When we tell those stories, people are attracted to that. I am. I love to hear testimonies, you know. It encourages me. This is what's happening here. Uh, a, a commitment like Joshua's, his verbal statement is powerful. People remember and, and we see God in our own lives because they are finally able, we're finally able to look outside of this wheel and it's freeing. And we say, oh, wow, there's a world outside there that looks more peaceful than the one I'm living in. I'm free of all this, free from all the chains and bondages of life that the wheel brings us. And, but, you know, the thing is, it's one of the hardest things to do 
to accept that freedom when we've been on that wheel for so long. Your verse that you have, I didn't, I didn't put it, uh, it talks about freedom, right? I, I, I have a story about freedom, which really helps me. I, I used to do a lot of long distance running, so ran marathons. So every Saturday I, I, I had a job that I worked till noon and then I would put on my running shorts and I'd run an eight mile loop and then I'd end up at home and then home for the weekend. Well, that eight mile loop had a, a, a road on it where two Doberman Pitchers lived and they had a wonderful electric fence. They're a wonderful thing. So after you know passing that fence with these Dobermans just salivating to get, you know, prime Mike Clemmer calf meat. You know, I could tell that's what they wanted, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, we didn't think about each other anymore because they couldn't get to me, right? So it was back in the days when I, had, I, I would run with one of those Walkmans, you know, those, the batteries would go out every two hours of use, but I was running, we listening to a, a Michael W. Smith CD, I remember it very well, and all of a sudden I get to the running for this place, and these two Doberman pinches are standing in the, in the road in front of me. Well, the first thing that happened, I went, ah! and my Walkman flew, and the batteries rolled and all that, you know. But they, they looked, and they growled, and you know what they did? They ran back into their yard, and I kept going. And I've thought of that so often. Those Doberman pinchers finally got off their hamster wheel, or they broke the boundary that was keeping them tied into that place. They were free. And they didn't like it. They, it, was, it was a new world out there. They ran back to their comfortable little world. That's what we do. Look, we, we, we've gotten pretty good at living with our pain, our broken relationships. We're on that wheel. Okay, I just keep going. I can forget it. I can live with this. I can live with this addiction. I can live with this. I can live with it. And then we get off of it and we go, wait a minute. Now I got to take head on some of these things off the wheel. And the thing is, when God, when we step off the wheel for God, he's with us. And he'll take us through that. But that freedom part is so hard to get through that we just don't. Freedom is why Jesus came. Galatians 5.1, Paul said it so well. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Boy, you use free twice there. It is for freedom that Christ... He says, so stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. I would say, don't, let your, don't be burdened again by jumping back on that hamster wheel, right? And notice this, Joshua does not tell them what they should decide to do, but it's his own statement saying, look, for me, my decision is to get off the wheel, and be faithful. And, and, and it was such an example that it helped them to see themselves what their de- decision should be. In other words, they were convicted. And at the end, they say, yes, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And when we declare our commitments to God together as a church and as a church community, it's even more po- powerful. You know, we as Mennonite church and even though you don't have Mennonite in your name, you're still Mennonite church, I think. Am I okay to say that? Jeff didn't look up. Maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> you're an Anabaptist community. We generally are not creedal people. You know what I mean. But I'll tell you what, there is something really powerful when a church reads together the Apostles' Creed and declares together what we believe. We believe in Jesus. We believe in God, the creator of all things. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Wow. So, so some of those declarations really have power and can bring us together. Let's look at the next couple of verses, Joshua 24, 19 to 21. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. See, Joshua's protective now. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. Wow, Joshua. That's not who the God that forgave your sins. It's not the God that we know, right? But Joshua's, now he's a, little, he's a little bit jealous. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, 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 no. We will serve the Lord. 
And I think what this is talking about is integrity, the need for integrity in our lives. When we make a decision to serve God, we are also called to live out that faith. If you remember the big thing that John the Baptist was upset about when the Pharisees would come out to be baptized, he said, you brood of vipers, you know, you don't show, you don't bear the fruit of your repentance. In other words, he's just living the same way. In fact, more prideful than before. You know, so the, there, there's a need for integrity. Commitment needs to show up in everyday life, and it's not just words. And I wonder how we're really doing at that. Joshua doesn't believe the Israelites understood this at all, and he questions their intent. That's what he's doing. They wanted to serve, but he wanted to make sure that the commitment needed to be heart, mind, soul, and spirit. I remember I read something a while back that Tony Campolo wrote. He said these, I wrote these words down, we are and become what we are committed to. In other words, it becomes our identity. We are and become what we're committed to. I was reminded my, when I was a young boy uh, in our community, there was a guy that everybody called Buzz Frederick. You know, so my dad would talk to him, Buzz, Buzz, Buzz. I said to him, what's Buzz's real name? And my dad said, I don't know. Well, why do we call him Buzz? He said, well, he's a beekeeper. And everybody knows he's the beekeeper, so they just call him Buzz. See, he, he became what he was committed to. Not, not intentionally. I mean, this guy wasn't like a nutcase beekeeper or anything. Sorry for those of you that have bees. You know, but, but, you know, it, 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 what, does my, what is my identity? When I walk by, do people say, Christian? Do they say, well, there's Jesus. I mean, who do we think about what we're committed to is who we become. And it's especially hard at home. I got to tell you, it is for me at least. At home, our true colors are displayed for those closest to us to see. And at home is where we need to be clear about our commitment to God. I mean, what do our, what do our children think, think of us? I had an anger problem growing up. I mean, when my kids were growing up. I mean, God has really dealt with me on that anger problem. And, and even to the point when, while I was working on me and my kids were teenagers, I mean, I'd be lying in bed and he'd say, go wake up your daughter and apologize to her. For what? He yelled for no reason at all. I'd go over and wake her up. You know, these are the things at home, you know, it's hard to be that. And listen, I'm not, we cannot be sinless. We are human beings. We cannot be perfect. We're only perfected through Christ, right? But where is our heart? Do our kids say, man, my dad is really struggling with this. You know, he's working at it. I see, I see Jesus working at him. I'm, uh, in my own home growing up, I remember several things that happened in life of my family that have impacted me just in unbelievable ways through the years. Uh, when I was seven years old, our family took a trip to Canada because my aunt was getting married up there. We never took a trip together. So there in our station wagon was my mom and dad and my three-month-old baby brother in the front seat, held. Of course, there was no car seat, so some of you remember those days, right? And and then in the middle seat was my sister, who at the time uh, would have been uh, 19 years old, my brother Ken, who was 16 years old, my brother Jerry, who was 14 years old, in the middle, and then seven-year-old Mikey was laying in back on top of the luggage, right? That's just what we did. I think maybe that, I, I might have hit my head there sometime. That, I, maybe that explains some of my stuff. But let me get to the story here. My brothers were so excited to go. They had saved all their lawn mowing money and all their stuff because in Canada you could buy fireworks and firecrackers. In the U.S. you couldn't get them at the time. So they, they spent their money. They had, you know, shoe boxes, two shoe boxes full of firecrackers and smoke bombs and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, we're getting close to the border on the way home, and they realized, uh-oh, we have to declare this at the border, and we can't take it in the United States. And the reason they said, uh-oh, is because they knew my dad couldn't lie. Isn't that amazing? They knew it. I knew it, too. So what they did, they stuffed it under me, my sleeping bag in the back. So now I'm scared. And we get to the border, and my dad, um, they asked him, do you have anything to declare? And 
my dad had a little bit of a stutter, and he, he didn't, uh, so it didn't even sound good. Uh, just one, and he reached over, and he got a bag. He said, we have these six postcards that we bought up here. And, uh, and they waved them on. And, and my brother started saying, God bless America, as soon as, it was kind of funny. It's just a family member, remember. But why am I telling you that story, and why do I remember that? Look, I lived in my father's home for 23 years. I worked side by side with my father in a high-pressure manufacturing facility for 12 years after I got out of college. I can tell you I never heard my dad lie, ever, living in the home with him. And I never even heard him swear. And I know that my dad cannot say the same thing about me in either case. But he was a man of character, and it made a difference. really did, you know? Um, So to declare your home as being one that's going to serve God does not mean that you don't get angry or even make mistakes or even lie at home, but rather that the, the closest people to you know that you're committed to your faith in God. It's a relationship that's important. Well, let's read, the, let's read on and get this thing finished. After Joshua's warning about the seriousness of what they were committing themselves to, to, the people responded in complete commitment. And here it is, verse 22. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away your foreign gods that are among you. Yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. It's about accountability. They set up accountability. Witnesses against themselves. Who are we accountable today? One of the greatest issues we have in our church today, in church with a big C, not your church or my church, the church, and in our society is that, and I can't only speak for men because I'm a male, okay? But we have men who are not accountable to anybody and will not be. I ask the question to myself, who could come into my life and say, Mike, can we talk for a minute? I have a question about how you've been acting here or doing that. And, and I would like to say I receive that as, as something to helpful. But there's a lot of men, even in our churches today, that do not hear from anybody like that. And I believe that's a problem. That's not accountability. We need to have people that we're accountable to. It's very important that the people are saying here, we're witnesses against themselves. In other words, they were just holding each other accountable. And sometimes this is the hardest things to do. But that's what church is supposed to be. Church is not judging and pointing fingers at someone. I hope that if someone came into your your community of faith here, someone that was really struggling, I don't know what it would be. Maybe they said, you know, I, I... they come to Pastor Jeff and said, Pastor Jeff, I, I'm addicted to something, and it, it's ruining my life. And, and, and Jeff would say, you know, I feel bad. I feel bad that you're addicted. That's horrible. You know, we're going to try to help you. That's the way it's, the, the response should be. But for many times, it's been just get away from me. You know, we can't really help you here. That, that's not helpful, and that's not what Joshua was talking about, about here. Um, so... I mean, today, they're committing to account, to be accountable to one another. And why is it so hard to talk about our commitments to God with our spouse and with our children? I don't know. I think it's a human thing. I believe that we need to be actively looking for ways to create a legacy of Christ-like living in our churches and our families. And it will affect people for generations. And he says here clearly, throw away your foreign gods. He said that before. That's an action. Stop being committed to those things that that uh, you shouldn't be identified with. Yield your hearts again. Here we have that yield thing, which is so hard. To hand over possession is what what yield means, to hand over possession, proving that we are making life changes that are consistent with what God requires of us. Uh, And then finally in verse 25 to 27, we see this. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak tree near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. 
It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you're untrue to your God. So we need to put up markers. Uh, I don't know, the, throughout Joshua, they put up all kinds of markers. It's amazing. What are the markers that we put up? Uh, I mean, as human beings, we forget so quickly our commitments, and markers can help. Um, but Joshua knew this, and that's why and that's why it is his last act as a leader. He knew that the actions of the fathers and mothers and grandparents and uncles and aunts are committing themselves to God and God's service that will yield much fruit, so he wanted a reminder to be in front of him all the time. I want to finish by reading a, a letter that I came in contact with a number of years ago. I didn't know about it till about 10 years ago. Here's what it reads. Our home is one of the many which were blessed by the recent revival in the Frank Cunha Mennonite Conference. We thank God that he has forgiven our sins and has given us victory over them. He has taken the misery of sins out of our hearts and has given instead the peace and joy of a born-again child of God. He has taken away old desires and has given us new joy in serving him. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we may grow daily in our Christian life and be a witness for him everywhere we go. And we look out into the future, our prayer is that God may have first place in our hearts and our lives and in our home, so that we and our children may know him as Savior and may be able to serve him better. This is signed by Mr. and Mrs. James Clemmer, Satterton Congregation, in the Gospel Herald in September of 1951. That was my dad. So he wrote this letter 10 years before I was born. He had two children at the time. He worked in a feed mill all his life. Dusty, dirty, hardworking man who changed the lives of many of his employees. Many came out of prison. Many were taken off the streets. At his funeral, you should have seen the line. But in 1951, he and my mother put up a marker by writing this letter. To the letter to the Gospel Herald. And I say today, is it a coincidence that my older brother Jerry, who was born two years after this was written, has been in full-time ministry since he's 18 years old, and he's now 70, and that I wrestled with a call to ministry and finally gave in 22 years ago? The markers we set up of the commitments we make do make a difference. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. You're never too old to put a marker up. Joshua put up his up at age 100. 100. And it made a difference. So here's the final thing I just want to review. The five things that Joshua said is be decisive and take a stand for Christ. Be willing to share your decisions publicly. Live lies of integrity. I know it's hard, but because you need to be accountable for your decisions. Put out markers of remembrance and witness. And then I finally want to just ask these questions at the end here. What are areas in your life that you need to rededicate to God? That's what recommitment is or making a commitment again. And then I make it personal. In my life, blank is something that keeps me from recommitting my life to God. What is it? I know there's a always things in my life. Those little idols, those little gods. What are they? Will you join me for prayer? God, we thank you for your words of scripture today, the lessons from Joshua, an old man, a wise man, a man who knew you intimately, yet still looked at his life and said, Lord, I need to recommit. I don't know where people are today. Maybe you feel like you are on the hamster wheel. (laughs) In fact, you're just hanging on to the hamster wheel and letting it spin yourself. That's a hard place to be. I think we've all been there. Lord, I just ask for those folks that you would grant them the courage to be able to, to step off. And when they do step off, that they would realize that you're with them and you would send people to encourage them. 
for others that just need a, just need a, a new word of encouragement to say, keep going, keep going, and, and maybe just a recommitment, just a, a check-in again, or maybe it's like a, an oil change, a spiritual oil change, Lord. Whatever it be, Lord, I just pray that whatever is blocking that today, whatever is the barrier that you would allow people to, to just make that commitment in their heart and put up a marker somewhere. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.